And welcome back to the Amazon Ad Studios. I'm Dominique Murphy, and I'm so excited for this next segment. I am delighted to be joined now by Michelle Ruiz, CEO of BiasSync, as we dive in the, into the transformative power of addressing unconscious bias in the workplace, a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Now, Michelle, having championed to create fairer and more inclusive environments within various organizations, including those in the advertising sector among many many others. Michelle is at the <laughs> forefront of diversity, equity, and inclusion across multiple industries. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Dominique, thank you. Thank you so much to give me the opportunity to talk about it. It's such an important topic, and obviously so many are talking about it, yes. right, even here. It seems to be the theme, if you will. We had the chairman on this morning, and a good half of the interview was focused on DEI. Now, he's not a specialist in DEI, but he was saying just the need for organizations and industries to start implementing a more inclusive environment, start incorporating more diversity into the day-to-day. -day. It's really powerful, and it seems to be a reoccurring theme that we've heard again and again. So having an yeah. expert like you is, is Oh, thank awesome. you. And you know, I want to say regarding that, it, yeah. it demonstrates that we are beyond the notion of we should have diverse workplaces or diverse teams. It's really about the positive impact. And it's not just for workplaces, but it's also for what happens externally. So you're, when we see it, uh, the topic of the day, so to speak, which is becoming more and more, it rec it's, it's acknowledging the, the, the impact, the positive impact of focusing on these these uh, priorities. Yes, and you're the CEO of an organization, a company called BiasSync. <laughs> yeah. If you're not familiar, you definitely want to tap in with Michelle and the work that you're doing from your white papers to, I mean, you are like the company, as far as I'm concerned, in the DEI space. So for people who are not familiar, Michelle, can you explain who and what BiasSync is and what you yes. do? Yes, yes. So what we do basically is we train for, measure, and ultimately mitigate the impact of implicit bias in organizations to lead to more fair and equitable workplaces. And we do that through an innovative behavior change approach that we developed and invented. Candidly, you know, Dominique, we share background, a similar background. We both came from television news. You, you much sooner, me a while ago. And, and if you would have asked me, would, do you envision yourself as a Latina in tech? I would have said, what planet did you fall off? But I did realize that I have good ideas and I can put great teams together. And so I, I uh, brought together some really fantastic data scientists, our CTO, my, my co-founder, Dan Gold, and we developed uh, an amazing behavior change approach through technology to Im mitigate the, the negative impact of implicit bias, and more importantly, to build more inclusive organizations and more equitable organizations, which is what you're hearing about now. How big of a problem is implicit bias? Oh, it's at the core of so much of what we do, and we don't re realize it. You know, implicit bias is not a bad word. Uh, implicit, we all have, it, very simplistically, implicit bias is about preferences for something and preferences against something that are implicit, unconscious, below the conscious awareness. We all have them, and we're not talking just about people, because more often than not, that's how we talk about it. But we, talk, we have preferences for certain types of cars, or certain neighborhoods, and not neighborhoods, or, or not cars, or things like that. The real issue, as it pertains to, and we focus on workplaces, is when we're not aware, when we're prone to stereotyping, and then stereotyping, and we're not aware, again, that's implicit, unconscious, it impacts the decisions we make, it impacts how we view people, it impacts how we view solutions, uh, or who we include or who we don't include, those kinds of things. So it's, it's pervasive, not always terrible, yeah. but we need to be aware of where it matters. So how do you see DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion evolving in the workplace, um, let's yeah. focus on advertising, but also other sectors as well. Sure, you know, so the, the, the priorities around diversity and then equity and then inclusion, et cetera, have been around for decades since the civil rights era, really. Uh, but what's, a, what's changing now, especially for forward-thinking organizations, is they get diversity. Diversity is about the numbers. How many of X do we have, Y, Z, et cetera? 
We're way beyond that. It's really about inclusion. How are all those various individuals, sometimes from underrepresented groups, but inclusion means also not necessarily just underrepresented groups, it's everybody. And then more importantly, you're starting to see more and more emphasis on the E, the equity. Mm -hmm. And so you're hearing more and more about equitable outcomes. You're hearing more and more organizations focused on the risks of inequity. It is now in the top three areas of focus for boards of directors of companies about equity. So we've evolved evolved the conversation and the focus because at the very basic level, inequity uh, is a risk for organizations for discrimination, for retention, for recruitment. You're seeing more and more litigation around inequity tied, by the way, very directly correlated to implicit bias. That is so interesting. I want to bring up something, and I know you'll be able to speak to this, Michelle. The chairman this morning of Advertising Week talked about one of the big issues that a lot of times he has seen um, is that organizations will hire someone because they're checking a box. Okay, we need someone who looks this way. Uh, you, great, right? And you know, if this, and then they they tout him out as like this is our DEI person within the organization. What I often hear, though, are from organizations, they say, well, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I hear it often where someone will say, I would love to hire someone who is diverse, whatever that definition may be, whether it's a female, minority, sexual orientation, whatever the, the diverse side may be, but they struggle finding the right talent. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do we address something like that? Yeah, you've raised some very interesting points. There's a variety of points in that question and statement. The first is, especially with the recent Supreme Court decision uh, around you know, admissions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, and, and Harvard is one of the universities there that, that came up against, uh, in front of the Supreme Court. Let's be clear, we cannot make hiring decisions based on someone's race or ethnicity solely and simply, and that's the driving. It is, as has been established in the Supreme Court affirmed, discrimination. However, that doesn't mean that you can't go out and prioritize making sure you have slates of candidates who are diverse and you're looking at objective measures, right? So how do we do that? We gotta do, we gotta reach out to groups, organizations, university groups, other kinds of groups, by the way, also that, by the way, should, that cater to underrepresented groups. We also, also need to be looking at the imagery that we are putting out there in the world, uh, our hiring imagery, our recruitment imagery, the language we're using, even just in, a, in gender, for example. Uh, there's certain language that research shows that if you put a certain language like assertive, well, women kind of shy away from that language in a job posting because they don't necessarily, or they may attribute something negative related to that trait, right? So languaging matters, so you can through effort, and there's more and more uh, you know, recruitment agencies that are they're focused on this, by the way, they need work here too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but you can bring in, and then what you do is you, have, you develop objective measures to evaluate someone. And I don't know if you've been in this situation, but I've certainly been in the situation where I'm the first Latina in the room or the first woman in the room. And that's not necessarily a fun place to be most of the time. Yes, it shows progress, but there's also tokenism. You don't want to be the token X. There's a lot of pressure in that role. So it's great to be number one, but you got to bring in two, three, and four pretty quickly to to, to um, uh, de-emphasize that. And then you mentioned advertising. So the need to focus on this, and when I say this, meaning mitigating the negative impact of implicit bias, crosses all industries. And in advertising, yes, advertising agencies are businesses. By the way, we have advertising agencies as some of our clients. But it also impacts the stories we tell. And you're hearing a lot in the interviews you're doing today about data and the importance of data and AI and data and all this kind of stuff. There's such a thing called equity in data. So if data is driving the decisions we make, we want to make sure that the data we're collecting and how we're collecting it is truly reflective of all the important groups that we're trying to serve. Because if we don't start with equity and data, we are making decisions that are disadvantageous to certain groups. So it, it does impact how we see people, the stories we tell, uh, the people we include. It's not just the people we hire and bring into the workplaces. So it's critically important in all facets of the work that we do.
You are a force, Michelle. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is so eye-opening. I know everyone at home watching this right now is going, yeah, incredible. Mm. So you mentioned, obviously, Biasync is a very successful company. Congratulations on, you. to you and Thank your team you. <laughs> on all the work that you have done. I would love to hear a success story. Would you share one? It could be in the advertising sector or any sector, but uh, a story that you're very proud of. Yes, well, um, a couple of things. So. Um, we, we actually, uh, we do federal work, we do state, local, commercial, uh, public sector, the whole thing. Uh, and so uh, we do have a contract with the executive office of the White House presidential personnel. So we can say we're at the highest levels of the government. Uh, and we do this work because as many know, the Biden and Harris administration has been very focused on these uh, areas of priorities. So there, there's that piece. The second piece I would say success stories are, and I can't name companies because we have confidentiality and we deal with data. That's the other thing. One of our areas of specialty, let me be clear, it's not just training, it's really real time data, state of the state. So you can see where implicit bias is in the organization by role, function, geography, location, et cetera. We don't disclose anyone's personal uh, bias assessments, but we do give organization leaders kind of a heat map visibility. Why? Because a lot of organizations say, oh, we need to have more women advance, or we have trouble with women staying in the organization. So what they apply is what I call the peanut butter approach. <laughs> oh, let's just do this across the organization. But the reality is over here in this group or PNL or department or division, et cetera, versus over here, you may have different issues related to that. So mitigation becomes very important in terms of what's special for this area versus over here. So in terms of case studies, I, I'm glad to say that um, uh, we have numerous clients in healthcare and biotech, and, and I mentioned advertising, uh, and, and sports and other areas, but in particular in biotech and healthcare. Uh, because if you've seen the headlines around how bias, really, bias kills in healthcare, uh, and you look at the outcomes for, for people of color as an example. So we have clients that we've been working on now going on, you know, we're a young company, uh, we're four years old. So we're working with, with clients that are, you know, an, into our fourth year of engagement and things like that. So I'm very proud of that kind of work. Uh, and we continue to evolve our tools and, and our um, uh, science-based um, uh, features and tools and things like that. That's what makes us distinct. And I can feel the passion. I'm shocked that it's four years. I would have guessed <laughs> like two decades based on the level of success you have achieved. And Jess, do you guys run as a, as a just like a well-oiled machine? So I, I'm sure a lot of people watching this right now are saying, okay, Michelle clearly walks the walk, talks the talk. But how do I implement this into my workspace? Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for someone who's curious about you know, aligning with you, your company, or even sure. just implementing DEI initiatives? Yes, yeah, so we're seeing a couple trends where we can fit in nicely. The first is, you know, there's a, a higher priority around hiring chief diversity officers and that ilk of role in organizations. The challenge with that is many times they are the first time that role has been implemented in the organization, and sometimes what they do is they pluck someone of a col you know, certain color or, or gender, and they put them in that role not having had experience before. So what does that mean? They're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're under-resourced uh, because they don't yet, the, the C-suite doesn't really understand what is required to, to suitably uh, uh, resource for, for this work. So what we do is we, we pride ourselves in, in really kind of what we call the, the white glove hand-holding. And we really help our CDOs and our organization leaders with you know, not only the, the easy onboarding, but also the, me the metrics, the data, the analytics. I mean, again, we deliver through a SaaS platform, the majority of what we do so that everyone has the same experience. And that's also how we gather the data and the analytics. Uh, and so uh, once we understand from the right stakeholders in the organizations what their priorities are, we make recommendations on the, which tools of ours that they you know, should deploy and how the data, what data they will get. With, you, know, you can't change what you don't measure. 
So with the data and the analytics, which is proprietary to us, then we also give them the recommendations on how to move forward. And if they don't have all of the talent inside to do that, we also have a roster of consultants, primarily mostly organizational behavioral PhDs and, and that ilk of specialty that can come in and either help them with policies, practices, or procedures, or additional very specialized training, like for those, for example, who are involved in hiring or performance reviews, you know, those kinds of things. Wow, So, yes. Michelle. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, we have multinationals, and we're in the process of rolling out in 27 languages, and BioSync at the moment is available in English and Spanish, and now we're working on the others. Uh, so, you know, our multinationals, you know, need solutions that are global in nature. I was going to ask what so, the future is, but yeah. <laughs> clearly very, very bright. We think so. Oh, yes, incredible. indeed. Well, Michelle Ruiz, oh, CEO, you. founder of Biosync. Thank, thank you, you so, so much for much, being darling. here, and thank, thank you, you for the work that you're doing. It's, oh, thank you, it's and very thank you needed. for amplifying we, the we, message. We appreciate it. We'll have to do it again. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you.